Welcome to Abiding Presence Lutheran Church, a place of grace. All are welcome. Our mission here is to seek God and serve others. Thank you for allowing us into your homes this day. A brief announcement, uh, Abiding Presence is going to have in-person worship services in this sanctuary beginning on July 11th and 12th. Look for emails, look for videos, look for more announcements about this and the days and the weeks ahead. Let's now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. We begin with the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and, and also with you. Let us pray. God of compassion, 
You have opened the way for us and brought us to yourself. Pour your love into our hearts, that overflowing with joy, we may freely share the blessings of your realm and faithfully proclaim the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Exodus, beginning at chapter 19, verse 2. The Israelites had journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sion, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord God to, called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you sp shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one. Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. A reading from Romans, chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. 
But God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Hi, kids. Today I'd just like to talk to you. Um, if you've been seeing anything on the news, it seems like it's a little scary or frightening out there, and I'd like to tell you a true story from when I was about 10 years old. At my house, from 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock, the news was on. Nobody talked from 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock. At 5 o'clock was the local news, and at 5.30 was the Huntley Brinkley Report, and from 5.30 to 6, we paid attention to the TV. And I remember one time, and you know, it's funny what we remember as we get older, but I remember seeing this, uh, this riot on TV. And I asked my dad, Daddy, why are those black people so upset? And my daddy said, Willie, there's a lot of mean people in the world. And I said, I don't understand why there's mean people in the world. And I remember what he said. He said, Willie, just go to church. Listen to the preacher. And when you get older, learn to look at a man's heart and not the color of his skin. The first part I understood, that second part, I was 10 years old. I did not understand how you look through a person's skin, so I rode my bike. But I did get involved in church. I listened very carefully to Brother Croft and sermons when I was 10 years old. And when I was to seminary about 30 years later, I remember Brother Crofton's preaching. I was active in Sunday school. I went to Sunday school, went to church. I joined the youth choir. I went to church on Sunday night because I was a good kid. I got involved in youth activities. And what you don't know is Mike was my youth minister back then. <laughs> Not really. But I became very active in youth ministry. But I remember what my dad said. Look at a person's heart. My first semester in college, I was away from home, I was nervous, not scared, and my roommates, honest to goodness, I had a, a PhD Korean student. I had a black roommate and I had a gay roommate. And it took me a year to learn to listen to their stories, to, to look at them through their eyes. I learned to look at their heart. And so as you see things on TV, and maybe you get a little nervous, you're not really sure what's going on, I'd encourage you to talk to your parents. Talk to Pastor Steve. He's really a smart guy. Uh, but as you grow in God's grace and grow in years, learn to look at a person's heart. Look through their eyes and see the life that they've lived. Don't judge a person by what you see on the outside. Learn what you learn, learn what you have, what they have on the inside. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned the twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter. His brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the Cananean and Judas Iscariot, the one who would betray Jesus. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles or enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. 
cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. From time to time, I uh, send my various thoughts and ramblings to your pastor, and he very humorously uh, indulges the, the ramblings of an old pastor. And the last one I sent to him was on sermons. And I said the longer I'd been in the ministry, the harder it was to write sermons because I became so aware of all the dynamics. Some people come to worship and they just want to hear that Jesus loves them and then they want to sing in the garden. And that's fine because it's tough out there, whether it's layoffs or furloughs or you're trying to teach your kids stuff they learn at school or the doctor appointments were not as, hope, not as pleasant as you hoped they were and you want to come to a safe place and you just want to hear that God loves you and you want to sing a song that speaks to your soul. But then there are those who have come to church and, and, I've, and I've heard them. And they said, Pastor, I want a sermon that makes me a little uncomfortable, challenges me theologically, challenges me socially, challenges me scripturally. And I don't know what song they're going to sing. But then you have people who uh, come to church and they are really looking for social justice. Some want to hear good, solid Lutheran theology. Some want to hear solid biblical theology. Years ago, I had my guy in my congregation where if I could give him 20 verses in a sermon, he was happy, and he'd write absolutely every single one of them down. And that's just half the dynamic. The other half of the dynamic is the pastor. Sometimes pastors want to give safe sermons because we're concerned. Sometimes we see things on TV, and they just strike a deep core in us, and we have to talk about it. Sometimes we have issues in our own life, as divorce or death, death of someone close to us, and, and for better or for worse, we use sermons as a way of expressing our grief. And so I use that introduction because in today's passage, Jesus is preaching. He is proclaiming. And it's a fascinating passage as you look at it. Jesus is teaching and he is proclaiming the gospel. To proclaim means to announce with conviction what you are about to say. And he is announcing with conviction a new understanding of where the kingdom where God reigns. And it's interesting that our translation says the people were harassed and helpless. If you look at the Greek, the word harassed at its roots means that they were being skinned alive. Or they were being extremely annoyed. And to say that they're helpless means that they were cast out of society. Their family didn't want them. The church didn't want them. Uh, nobody wanted to have anything to do with them. And Jesus had compassion. Literally, to have compassion means that Jesus got a tummy ache. His innards started feeling weird on him. So then Jesus, uh, Matthew, names all 12. And it's interesting that even in the... Uh, in the ninth chapter of Matthew, he wants you to know that Judas is going to be the bad guy. And Jesus commissions these 12, and he says, I want you to go out to these people who are extremely annoyed, and I want you to go out to these people who are cast out of society that nobody wants. Don't go to the Samaritans, go to the Gentiles. It's not time for that yet. That we will see more in Matthew 28, 25, when he says, go to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then Ern ends with verse 8, which Pastor Steve would prefer he did not take literally when it comes time to look at his salary for next year. If you don't know what verse 8 is, you can look it up. But Jesus is proclaiming this understanding of the kingdom of heaven, and then he tells it at the 12, I want you to go do the same. And what's fascinating to me is I've studied this passage over the years. It doesn't tell us what they said. Jesus said to go proclaim. Matthew wrote down, we went out and proclaimed, but they didn't tell us what they said. So we have to back up for trying to make some sense. Matthew 5 through 7, we have Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 8 and 9, Jesus is doing a lot of healing, and he is demonstrating what the reign of God looks like. 
as opposed to Roman reign, which is uh, one of oppression and violence. The leaders, the religious leaders of Jesus' time, theirs was one of excluding people from the presence of God. And if I sort of insert Paul here, the reign of God is where there is no Greek and there is no Jew, there's no slave, no free, there's no male, and there's no female. And if I can reference last week's uh, creation story, we are all created in the image of God. That's such a simple concept, but it's also such a difficult concept for us to get a hold of because we, we've, we uh, categorize people, we value people based on wealth, on how attractive they might be. We value and devalue people according to their skin color, whether they be straight or gay or questioning. We value and devalue people if they're Protestant or Catholic or Christian or Jew or Muslim. We place value on people, whether or not they're immigrants or illegal immigrants or they're naturalized citizens. We place value on people if they have special needs. But in God's kingdom, where God is truly reigning, we see in each other's eyes the image of God. And in Jesus' time, that was insane. Many times, as throughout the New Testament, Jesus' disciples are walking down the road. And they say, Jesus, this person over here is, has something wrong with them. What was their sin that they are suffering? They're an outcast of society. They've been cast out of worship. They've, in a sense, been cast out of God's presence. And Jesus said, essentially, not in God's kingdom. And this is to be announced with great conviction. In God's kingdom, there are no outcasts. And so Jesus says to the twelve, you are to go to the places of suffering and discrimination and prejudice, and you are to somehow in your lives reflect the Sermon on the Mount. You are to somehow reflect the kingdom of heaven has come near as you cure people and raise the dead and cleanse those who are uh, unclean and cast out spirits, unclean spirits. In the midst of the darkness and insanity of our world, you and I are called to proclaim with great, uh, with great decision the kingdom of heaven. We are to proclaim with the eyes of compassion and hands of action. There's been a Paul <clears throat> A P A L L, a Paul over our country since spring. First, it was COVID 19. And in excess of 110,000 people in our country have died. And you can look at that and you can say, where is the reign of God in all of this sadness? And there's still so much we do not know. To me, the kingdom of heaven is those first responders who left their place of safety. And they went to the hot zones in New York to care for those who are suffering. And they left behind their family. And they left behind birthdays and Mother's Days and what they thought might be graduations. The kingdom of heaven came into this world when the nurse held the hand of a person taking their last breath. And both of them were in tears. That is the proclamation of God's kingdom. And as I thought about this COVID thing, and I wondered how has my life been changed by it? For my part, I had a better, a better appreciation for life, having an infant grandson born into the world, and also help, helping to take care of a 90-year-old, 97-year-old mother-in-law. The tentativeness of life, the fragility of life, the beauty of life on both ends of the spectrum. And then we go out of the frying pan into the fire. We have these turmoil on the street with protests and riots. And we're, we're taking off old scabs off of old wounds. And we're bleeding as a society. And you could ask, <clears throat> where's God in all of this? What are you talking about this kingdom of heaven? Do you not see what's going on on TV? 
reflecting on our lives, we are living in a time in which people feel harassed and helpless. But here's what I saw. I think it was in Knoxville. A white police officer got separated from the rest of his group. And his back was a, was a storefront. I think it was a pizza parlor. And he looked out there at all these angry protesters, and I read the story. He said he knew he was in trouble until the other police could get to him. But then a black man came out of the crowd and said, you're going to leave him alone. One police officer, one man, and an angry crowd. And out of that crowd came other black men who locked arms together and they said, you are not going to harm this police officer. And his life was saved. To me, that is the kingdom of heaven coming to a society that is harassed and helpless. God's reign is when people of various colors and various life ex experiences come together and we talk and we listen and we learn to appreciate the beauty of each other and we see in each other the image of God. Reflecting on our passage, <clears throat> we live in times in which people are harassed and helpless. And you are the abiding presence of Christ in our world. In your baptism, you are called to proclaim. You are called to embody the kingdom of heaven. Let us confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. Holy One, you bring us together and call us your own. Bless theologians, teachers, and preachers who help us grow in faith. Guide your church that we might be a holy people. Hear us, O God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. Holy One, the whole earth is yours. Where there is fire, bring cool air and new growth. Where there is flooding, bring abatement. Where there is drought, bring rain. Inspire us to care for what you have provided. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, we have created divisions that you will not own. In places of conflict, raise up leaders who work to develop lasting peace and reconciliation. Encourage organizations and individuals who care for all forced to leave their homes. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, you care for those who are harassed and helpless. Protect and defend those who are abused. Heal those who are sick. Feed all who, who hunger. Empower all whose voices go unheard. And help us respond to the pressing needs of our neighbors. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, you provide a plentiful harvest of gifts and resources. Prepare us to labor and gather the fruits of this congregation, that we might discover new ways of living. Minister to us in our work, that we do not lose heart. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Holy One, you bring all people to yourself. We give you thanks for the holy people who have gone before us. Sustain us in our mission until the day you bear us up to join the saints in light. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O oh God, in those too deep for words, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let's share a sign of peace with those around us. If there's somebody on your heart right now, I invite you to text them. Peace be with you. Chip, peace be with you. And also with you. As you prepare to share your gifts with Abiding Presence, I just want to draw your attention to a, a, a beautiful thing that has happened over the past couple of months since our Lenten offerings have uh, continued to come in. Over $30,000 has come in to help pay off the back end of our mortgage. Um, right now, our mortgage is under $300,000. What an amazing gift that has been given to this congregation. It's a gift that ensures that this place will be here to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ in word and deed for many, many years to come. Thank you for your continued generosity.
Let us pray. Holy and generous host, you give us the joy of celebrating our Lord's resurrection. Give us also the joys of life as we use each blessing for service in your name and bring us at last to the full joy of life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the thanksgiving for the word. Let us pray. God of justice and love, we give thanks that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need. Awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end, bring all the world to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. And now receive the blessing. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. May God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Be at peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.